Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar today entitled Building a Resilient Enterprise with Insight to Internet Performance. Uh, I'm very excited about today's session. We are fortunate enough to have uh, Mike Hicks with us from A Thousand Eyes, who is one of their uh, uh, principal solution analysts uh, to share some of his perspectives and insights into how the internet is working today. Um, as a quick reminder to our friends uh, who are joining us, uh, first and foremost, this is uh, part of our Business and Resilience at All Time webinar series that we have been uh, putting on for the last several uh, weeks, which uh, has covered three specific areas of uh, our organization. The first one has been uh, what we are entitling the next normal, where uh, members from our team within Orange Silicon Valley have been leading uh, discussions around those top types of topics. We've also uh, been running a series entitled uh, uh, Enterprise Solutions from that part of our organization within uh, Orange Business Services, where I am. And uh, also uh, a Leading with Partner series, which this particular webinar today is a part of. So uh, this is a continuation of that uh, activity that we've had uh, going on for a few weeks now. Uh, as I mentioned, today's topic is building a resilient enterprise with insight into internet performance. Uh, I am uh, joined by Mike Hicks, Principal Solution Analyst at Thousand Eyes. Quickly, as a reminder, my name is Mark Schlesinger. I'm the Director of Strategic Partners uh, for the Americas here at Orange Business Services and couldn't be more excited to, than I am to be with Mike today. Just really quick before uh, we get into uh, a little bit of background on Mike and we jump right into our topics, a couple of housekeeping items. You will notice on the right hand side of the screen there are several tabs, one of which is entitled chat, one of which is entitled questions. Uh, Mike and I will be monitoring both of those areas during the course of the presentation today, so please feel free to share your thoughts, comments, feedback with us as we go through the session. And uh, also please uh, we welcome your questions uh, in real time, so don't uh, hesitate to post your questions on the questions tab. Mike and I will be taking those as we progress also through the day. Um, only Mike and I can see the questions, so uh, hopefully that'll give you some confidence in uh, entering you, you know, some of the queries that you uh, might or topics you might be interested in talking about. Uh, a little bit of background on Mike, uh, aside from the fact that he is a coffee aficionado, um, Mike has had a, a tremendous amount of global experience working uh, in with and in complex uh, networks throughout uh, the world. Uh, he's also been an author of managing distributed applications and troubleshooting in a heterogeneous environment and optimizing applications on Cisco networks. So uh, I think Mike's insights today will be uh, quite interesting as we start to explore our topics. So as I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, we're gonna focus on uh, a few areas today specifically, which I provided to Mike in advance of our session. Uh, we're gonna focus on the role of the internet in the enterprise today and what it really means to uh, multinational large organizations. We're gonna talk about uh, what internet data is important to the enterprise and why uh, that data is important. I think you'll find that quite uh, interesting to review and hear about from Mike. And then of course, uh, uh, we're gonna get a perspective on how the internet has performed in, uh, in 2020. So Mike, again, let me first start by saying welcome. It's our true privilege to have you with us today and uh, I appreciate you joining us from uh, uh, halfway around the world. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's nice to talk to somebody from Australia. Uh, that being said, let's uh, jump right into uh, our topic, the first topic, I guess, uh, the role of the internet in the enterprise today. You know, we're seeing from our customers quite a lot of bit of uh, enterprise internet consumption, especially with all things that have happened relative to COVID. Uh, the internet has taken on a, a much more important role than I think we could have imagined, although we had started to see trending moving in that direction uh, prior to that with the types of customers that we typically target. 
why don't you share your perspective on the role the internet uh, has today in uh, in the enterprise? Yeah, certainly, Mark. Thanks very much for that, and uh, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, I like officiado. I, I I tend to call myself a coffee snob, but <laughs> potato potato. <laughs> um, you're absolutely right. You know, the the internet has is, is, is taken on a, a ever more important role within um, within our world from there. Yeah, and we like to think of the internet now as being the new network backbone for us from there. This obviously started prior to the uh, the, the COVID, the pandemic we're going through at the moment. You know, there was this migration towards the the, the cloud uh, from the data center perspective to a hybrid type of environment, as well as then an adoption of a lot of SaaS applications themselves. Uh, you know, so we're now relying on this internet as our business connectivity. Whereas in the past we had sort of our, our MPLS networks or our standard networks around from there. You know, we should now start to replace some of those environments with uh, SD-WAN. So we've got this mix, this hybrid type environment coming across from there. The point is, is this internet, like I said, is now critical. This is now the corporate backbone. This is the, the network connectivity that you've got to you're going to run your business critical applications on. You know, it's no longer just this um, uh, connectivity where we go and sort of stream our videos and watch cat, uh, cat videos and, and the like from there. The, the, the problem this is then presents to us that we, we've got from there is that the traditional way from an ed ops perspective is when we've been looking at this is we you know we, we've got a, a sort of a, a finite view of where we can actually see when we start to go into this which is now a critical uh, backbone uh, component we can't actually see uh, what's going on and that the internet is, itself is this um, is a collection of autonomous uh, systems uh, around from there there's no central control across from that and it's effectively a black box or it becomes a black box to us and what we found is that with a traditional NetOps approach, part of the problem is actually 90% of the time to this resolution is actually trying to identify where the issue is. You have this field full of haystacks, one of them's got a needle in, you don't know where to start looking. It's not sufficient enough just to simply say, the problem's within the network, you need to know where it is, whose responsibility it is, and where you can go from that one there. And the trouble is as well, you want to get ahead of this curve, right? It's no good having the users phone you and saying, we've got a problem at that one there, because you're then chasing your tail, you're trying to get across in that way there. So looking at sort of the traditional way of, of doing these things from an ingress, egress, looking at uh, sort of packet level data, you, 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 you're you looking effectively in a rear view mirror. You need to be able to see what, what what's going on from there. And also looking at this point, it's like me looking at my window here in Perth, Australia, and trying to tell the weather in Boston. You know, I can give you an indication of what's looking outside my front window, but I'm not going to tell you how that weather pattern changes you know, across the time zones and across the, the miles from there. So the idea is you want to get the visibility into that. And this is where Thousand Eyes starts to come in. So, you know, you, you, the, the visibility you traditionally had on your network itself, you now want to extend. We talk about the Internet becoming your new uh, backbone, your, your corporate backbone from there. You want to have that, that visibility in, into there. The reason you do that is obviously because we can now see where the fault is. We can start to identify where that, that um, uh, the area of responsibilities we need to come to, but also who's responsible for it. We talked about the, the internet being this collection of um, uh, autonomous networks within there. There's often different ISPs. Your provider where you connect into might have a transit provider connected to them or will certainly have a transit provider connected to them that may connect into a cloud provider from there. You want to understand who's responsible for the delay, the degradation to your business critical application. So, you know, one, so you can actually have that discussion from there, but also so you can take um, sort of corrective action. You might want to sort of change how you go from a path perspective from there. It might be that you want to spin up a back backup link or, or simply move a service across, you know, from uh, you've got something in a cloud operation, just one region. We can't get to that one there. We want to spin it up another region from there. So by having that visibility, you can identify who, who is responsible party, as well as then seeing where, where the fault is. And if you can do this with a, um, an emulated user, with a synthetic type of approach, you can get ahead of the curve. We can see a problem or some build up in that environment before it occurs. You know, it's, it goes back to the adage of a, of a telephone. If I pick up, no one's got a desk phone now, if I pick up a desk phone, I expect to have a dial tone. It's no good picking up, I have no dial tone on there, I can't make the call. And that's the same principle. If we can run a synthetic test across there, we can get ahead of a problem to, before it actually occurs within there, or before the users become aware of it. Uh, thanks for that uh, initial insight, uh, Mike. Uh, quite interesting. I want to go ahead and see if we can potentially transition over to some questions from the audience here. Uh, looks like we have a question. The first question we received is from Jessica. 
Um, it looks like Jessica's interested in understanding, uh, wouldn't flow data give me insight to my traffic across the internet? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And obviously this is where we start to talk about legacy world. What, what, a, what a flow information is giving us is usage data, but it's giving us from a point perspective. So we're looking at the fetch for that ingress egress point. And to be able to get that flow data, there's two things. One, we've got to have control of that environment. So we've got to be able to configure that device to actually send us the flow data back um, and, and, and provide that information out for, for, from there. You know, you can obviously put systems in way, appliances in there. But again, we're talking about ingress egress point. What that then also gives us is, is, is um, we've got to be know where the traffic's going to go. So I said, so one, we're actually looking at this point. We're not going to get the hops that go across that path. We're going to get only the air we control, and we're only going to get a point-to-point -point view. You know, because I said, flow data is actually a, um, a single point of view perspective. We're looking at this type of information. We work on the bi-directional flows coming in, and then you create a map based on that. But it can't tell you what's happening on those middle areas there. And it also is usage data, as I said, from there. So it's actually looking in our rear view mirror. We're seeing we have a usage problem. We're seeing what's going on to that one there. One, we don't know what point within the network is that we all, the, all we can actually do is we know it's a utilization problem. If we want to go a stage further than that, we want to start to use things like um, IP fix to actually start to, uh, and, uh, and sort of NBAR to start to give us some context of a performance type of information. It then becomes kind of compute um, resource heavy on those devices themselves. So we stop the infrastructure doing what it's supposed to do, which is forwarding the packets to get across from there. We're taking it away from that. So then you start to get sort of data integrity issues and you're missing data that comes across from that aspect there. So flow data gives you a, a good indication of usage. You can start to utilization, but it's not going to give you that visibility if we go from the complete path. As I said, if you have to take a different path, you're not going to understand that. All you're going to know is that we have a usage problem coming out from here. We don't know that our route changed or path policies changed from, from across there. So great. Thanks for that, uh, Mike. Let's go ahead and move on to our second uh, topic. And I, I particularly uh, uh, am excited to hear about this. Uh, you know, everybody is, is struggling with this massive amount of information now uh, and being able to interpret all of it and capture it and uh, decide what you can extract from it that's relevant. Uh, is becoming important by the more important by the minute. So uh, maybe you can share some thoughts around why this internet uh, data is so important to the enterprise. Well, we might have lost Mike here for a second. Let's see if we can get him to come back. You know, Perth, Australia isn't next door. So let's see if uh, he lost power or uh, he's able to come back. Let's just give him another minute. Uh, I, I realize, uh, see, patience is a virtue. The, the wonder of the internet. It just yes. Talk it's, about the it back. <laughs> it's the power of the internet. Look, I'm sure we identified a huge problem there, Mike. So uh, thanks for coming back and joining us. Again, uh, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about uh, the uh, data that you're capturing now and the significance it plays in uh, understanding how your networks are performing and operating. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I actually can't see the, the, the presentation at the moment, so it looks like I've got the video up uh, from there. So, um, oh, I'll just stop that. So if, uh, if, if you just sort of load that the deck back in from there, then uh, we'll go to that. But let me let me start off before I actually get to that point there as well. So um, essentially what we're saying when we get to the um, uh, when we have this, uh, when we look at the Internet itself, we're looking at this complex interaction of systems across from there. The image that I've got when we actually when we get the, the deck up there is a, is actually a coffee. I talked about being the, the, the coffee snob at, at the start. And when you consider what goes up to uh, to, to make out um, what uh, um, what uh, what makes I'm sorry, I was just laughing at a question that came up there. Um, what 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 makes up the coffee to actually do that type of a, a connection together? We have to have the milk at a certain temperature. If it's a different type of milk, the coffee coming in from those types of aspects there. Um, and then everything we actually need on that point um, to actually do from there is uh, uh, to, 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 to have that combination together. What we actually then to do is to, to, to test it with the spoon to lay on there. And a the spoon, thank you very much, that's better. The spoon will actually give us this, um, uh, it will take a few seconds to actually sink through from there. So therefore we know this complex interaction of systems is all actually working together to produce a cup of coffee that you know, in Australia, we'll actually say this is the correct uh, temperature. This is what we want. This is where we go from there. If the spoon sinks too quick. It might be that the milk's off. It might be that it wasn't heated to the right temperature. And it's this interaction of stuff that, that needs to go together. And this is what we actually need to do to, to understand from a uh, uh, from a, a delivery perspective over the internet. And when we actually consider that then from uh, what we need to do for our, our, our journey, we need to understand every dependency we've got going through there. So when we actually make a call, we talk about this complex system. We talk about the fact that we have these third-party plugins, for example, on, on a website there. We have an API call. We have microservices distributed around the area there. We have back-end systems that need to, to interact from there, from there. We're passing some of the traffic over internet. Some of it serves from a CDN. You need to be able to understand how those dependencies interact with each other. And the best way to do that is to actually look through the transaction to go from there. because. The other way, a traditional way of doing it is to, under, is to try and understand it in advance to say, oh, well, this is the architecture of the application, therefore we'll instrument at this point here, instrument from that one there. If we talk about a SaaS application, you don't necessarily have the right to actually set the instrumentations from there. You can get a certain amount of, of stuff, but by then using Thousand Eyes to do an emulated transaction against that system, we can actually then understand, for example, the login process. So how, what was the, uh, the authentication process that took place? Where's it, where? And by doing that, you can identify where each of those degradation points were in that delivery system that comes over, that, that aspect there. So in terms of what data do you actually need, you know, we talk about machine learning and vast amounts of data from there. You actually need to be able to understand the various steps that we go through to actually do our complete user journey. So from us, the, the user uh, requesting the URL uh, on, on the, uh, the website to going through doing authentication, to actually loading a page in or executing a transaction, you actually need to understand each one of those steps that go through there. The same way as you need to understand sort of that, that the, what's the makeup of the coffee. And then what becomes your uh, your spoon on top of the coffee to test that is the digital experience of the user themselves. So that transaction load time, what is the overall time that makes up? So to go through all those steps, this is the response time or the transaction time we're going to get from that one there. So you actually break it up into those various areas that we go from there. Now, on top of that, we have this concept of what I call disconnected influences. So this picture we're actually looking at here is um, it, it's of the uh, it's not the Large Hadron Collider in CERN. It, it's this little brother that goes from there. So it's, a, it's a, the smaller Hadron Collider. I think it's still sort of some miles that go around from there. Now, what this is, is, is an image from inside of it from there. And it's actually quite difficult to see. But at the top, there you see those red lines that are sort of bent going out from that area there. They were running the tests on this, and every every day at the same time, their metrics were out. Um, so they were. This wasn't the one they actually disproved the speed of light in, but it was a similar type of concept. So they're actually going through this, and they were getting sort of their figures were being skewed off. They couldn't work out what it was. They had instrumented every part of this collider to actually understand what was going on. It was only when they discovered this was happening exactly the same time of day that they actually somebody worked out that the where it went, it went underneath Lake Geneva. And at the same time, it also there was a railway line that went across the top of that. And the efficiency of the train system in Switzerland, what was happening was that this train was then causing this electrical interference that was dragging the signal slightly off as it went through where they ran their tests. So this is what we mean about a disconnected influencer. 
the train system itself, you wouldn't think, and you wouldn't want an instrument that, that goes on that particular area there. It's not necessarily part of you, but it have a direct influence on actually getting your results out. And the same then applies to us from an internet perspective. So we'll measure our end-to-end -end path. We'll understand the path of our transaction that goes from there. There might be another transit provider from your ISP, sort of down or two or three streams from there, that's having an outage. It's only got one peering point that goes into his system there. Uh, so you're actually routing to many areas. By the time you hit this one, he's got a fault and you can't go any further. So by understanding these disconnected influences, I call them from there, overlaying that with your transaction test, you get a pretty good understanding, again, the responsibilities. It might not necessarily be something that you can solve within your area because it's downstream of your um, uh, uh, reach, as it were. But what you can do is then when the help desk comes in, well, there's two aspects. When the user phones up, say the problem, you're already aware of it. Yes, we have an issue. It's, it's outside of our control. It's within its domain. We're taking steps to remediate it. And those steps could be that you know where it is, so we're going to actually go and reroute around that. We're going to make sure we go a different path. We might want to spin up another sort of a, a point to new DNS resolver or whatever that situation is from that one there. But the point is you have to have this view of what goes on from your end-to-end -end transaction test as well as this overarching theme of what's happening in the internet as well uh, that goes across from there. And one of the things that obviously we can do from a thousand eyes perspective is because we have these billions of tests running around from that area there, we have a very good view of what's happening on the internet as a whole. So you can actually take that information as well as what you're looking for your individual aspect and understand how that is impacting your own environment or your own world that you're going on from there. So if you want to take that into a, into a sort of practical example from, from that aspect there, when we're talking about the steps taking up. So, you know, here we've got a, um, a media company. They've got to monitor their streams to their customers. They've got a CDN out from there. By using a number of agents sort of in the cloud themselves, uh, enterprise agents which reside within data centers from that as, uh, there as well, um, as well as endpoint agents on sort of some of their, uh, their users themselves, you can start to run a series of tests to understand what's happening. We can understand then sort of how the CDNs are performing, um, you know, what's our part, overall path uh, connectivity going from, from there as well. How the um, how say which CDM we're going to we're going to the correct one is our any cast working correctly or being routed to the most uh, local ones where our users are and you start to build this very uh, comprehensive picture all with proactive traffic. So again, so before a problem essentially occurs, in theory you can get ahead of that problem by understanding what's happening because you're proactively testing and then that overarching theme with the internet stuff that's not connected to us directly, but those disconnected influences have a view of that, overlay that over the top, and we can see what's impacting us and take effect that we go on from there as well. No, that's great. So I really like the idea of this comprehensive correlation that you're talking about, right? You're looking at inside, you're looking at outside, uh, you know, and you're putting that full picture together for evaluation and, and analysis. That uh, That's great, it resonates quite well with me. I think it does with our customers too. Um, we have another question I, the, from the audience just came in in uh, relation to this topic and uh, I, it has to do with understanding uh, service delivery chain. I guess the question from what I can understand here from Samir is that uh, what if I don't know which components make up my entire service delivery chain? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And and 99% of the time, people don't know what it is, you know, because said that there's components in there that they've no idea uh, that, that they have have to do that. So the best way that that, that I recommend doing this is, is is by creating a baseline to actually understand what's happening from our environment. So what we can actually do through this is um, uh, you, you by having a transaction, you don't necessarily know what part is going to take to that, what components are going to hit, but you know the end point. So you know my starting point and my, my end point. We start this, this transaction going off from there. And by doing that, it actually automatically discovers the dependencies and the various components that make up that service delivery chain. Once we go through that to understand from there, we also get an understanding of what the performance is from various locations, depending on where we're doing that test from. And from that aspect then, we can now start to set thresholds around from there. So we know, okay, this is the DNS resolve we've got to, to, to go to, uh, to actually make this, and therefore that then becomes our, our base threshold. We want to always connect to a DNS resolver in Australia from a connecting from, from those aspects there. Uh, you know, and then it might go on to a, a CDN from that one there, and again, from a local perspective. I start to understand what the performance I should expect to do from that 
but more importantly, what components are making up that path from there. And once I've done that, I can actually go through and put markers within that test itself so that when I go and track that from an ongoing perspective, my baseline effect becomes dynamic and I can then start to track against it to say, all oh, right, this is where it's blowing out from this particular area here and this is the part that's responsible for it. So it's, it's a matter of discovery. You know, if you rely on an architecture diagram to do that, quite frankly, you're gonna miss parts out. There's always something within there, a third party plugin or something that you didn't know existed um, or, or you weren't sure existed. Someone's put in there or it makes a call to something uh, that you weren't aware of. You know, an analytics page is a great one for this. You know, when you go off to third party analytics to see you know, how many um, people got hit on a website uh, and sort of how many uh, 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 drop offs or these types of things from there, they will often go off to various different sites. It can become a degradation to your actual page itself. So by understanding they exist, that becomes a component within your page that you can track and understand what goes on from there. I want a bit of a tangent, but I hope that answers the question. No, no, that's uh, that's great. Thank you for that. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to our third uh, our third topic. I think there's a lot of uh, interest in um, hearing about this, right? Uh, and that topic, of course, is you know how is the internet performing in the first part of this year? Uh, obviously, it's been heavily relied upon, uh, more so than I think anybody could have expected, and uh, there's been quite a bit. <clears throat> There's been quite a bit of uh, uh, activity that uh, uh, enterprises have had to respond to. So uh, let's uh, hear some of your thoughts around what's been happening from an insight perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So this is an abstract from um, our, our report. We did an internet performance report, the state of the uh, the internet, uh, which, which was released there. So again, you can actually download that from us, a full report. But just to give you some insights of what was occurring here, uh, you know, this, this, this first screen shows us the outages that we see from a global perspective. So what we actually start to see, if we take a baseline perspective of being February, what we had then was, um, a, 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 yeah, and we take February as that baseline in this particular case, uh, because you know, sort of January is the end of the holidays and, and, and the light come from there. So February gives us a nice starting point. When March came around, uh, which is the start of the lockdown orders from a global perspective, we saw a huge jump in the number of outages. And outages to us is 100% uh, is packet loss that goes uh, for 100% for, for, um, uh, packet loss is determined as being an outage across from there. So we saw this huge increase in March, both across the ISPs and again on the cloud providers themselves. So the cloud provider networks, you know, the Azure, the Googles, who actually have their network infrastructure themselves. Very similar sort of patterns that came across from there. The difference then from the ISPs is then over the period of time between April, May, June, and July, we start to see it sort of come down in terms of the uh, the number of outages that are you know, relevant to, to what we saw post the COVID. Uh, whereas the cloud providers sort of started to come down, they had a little bit of a jump up again when we went across from there. When we looked at those, what those outages were though, it's, it's really that, um, and, and this kind of coincides with happening in March, was there was sort of a lot of traffic engineering type of exercises. So with the, 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 the lockdown orders started to come in place, people were, the, the, the providers were starting to prepare themselves for essentially this, this it was, it, there was an increase in traffic that hit on the internet and we've seen all the figures that have sort of come out from the cloud flares and the likes from there. But more importantly, it was where that traffic was gonna come from. So what the providers were doing was a change in their peering points, sort of, sort of diverting paths so that they were, were going sort of more to that last mile type of uh, access uh, um, uh, solution and provide sort of more greater pathways into uh, CDNs. Some of them opened up some of the, uh, the, uh, the bandwidth that they had. So rather than restricting or throttling it back, they're opening up the available bandwidth from there. So this was accounting for the outages. We saw a lot of traffic engineering exercises that were going on from that aspect there. And that applied to both of the, both the cloud providers themselves. So this varied by region to region. So on the left-hand side there, we're looking at the, uh, the North America stuff. So we had this peak again uh, in, in March and it started to decline. Uh, again, so you know, coincided with the lockdown orders that came in place. Uh, when we look at the centre one, that's EMEA. Again, we saw um, sort of a rise compared to the start of the year in, um, in in a March period, and then it continued to rise as as we went through. Um, this, you know, again, there, there's sort of different areas, and EMEA is obviously a, a large area in terms of um, uh, both sort of geographic region, but but the, the number of countries and time zones, and therefore provides it starts to, to cover in from there. But what we were seeing was that, you know, the, the lockdown order started to ease and then come back up. So it was kind of, again, what we believe was happening was almost a change 
to, uh, to, to start to, to um, uh, ready themselves for a change back in working patterns. And then it kind of never really took off, so it sort of changed back again. So we saw this incremental rise. If you look at an APAC perspective, which is the third one from there, we had a large peak um, uh, in, in the March period. Again, very typical of what we saw. And then it's declined since that one there. Again, these all related to what we believe to be traffic engineering exercises. So getting ready for this shift in traffic patterns to come in, in play. To sort of back that up or to, to correlate that as well, you know, we said there was an increase in traffic across from there, uh, but it wasn't any sort of serious network congestion occurred. In fact, when the March time uh, uh, kicked in, we actually saw the, and this is North America we're looking at here, we actually saw uh, an improvement in the, uh, uh, the performance uh, from a latency perspective uh, 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 in the March period now where I said where they effectively opened up the pipes opened up the throttles they moved across from here and we saw this, this slight increase coming from there and then we've seen sort of very small degradations uh, since that but what this showed to us that there was no systemic degradation across from there there wasn't a congestion on the network the network itself the internet if you want to call that was actually sort of kind of healthy in its performance it was actually doing so these uh, latencies, congestions, periods weren't actually directly correlated with any increase uh, in the disruptions that we saw across from there. And it was really just sort of usage patterns that, that, that came into there. The, first part, the final part of this really is, is then, and this is kind of flipping back to what I've been alluding to right through, is that sort of the outages is there's, you know, we talk about it being 100% packet loss, but the outage itself can have a different impact depending on what time of day it actually occurred from there. So. And what we were saying then was if we looked at it from a non-business hours compared to a business hours, with a business hour being uh, between uh, 9 and 6 p.m. Uh, during uh, sort of the weekday, everything outside of that was considered to be non-business hours. You know, and, and what we found for the most part across all regions was that um, uh, most of the outages, again, were occurring in these out-of-business hours. So you know, there was, was as, as little disruption to user base as, as possible. Uh, going on during this, this, this period of time there uh, because there were traffic engineering exercises and it was just the providers sort of making their uh, infrastructure um, as, 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 uh, as productive and, and, uh, and as efficient as possible during these out of hours times. So yeah, you know, the overall conclusion we, we came across this is that the internet did pretty well during this, um, uh, during this period, sort of the, the first half of, uh, of 2020. You know, despite everything we threw at it from there, it actually has kind of held up at well. And the providers did a good job of sort of engineering the network to, to uh, cope for this, uh, this, this macro change that we saw. No, that's uh, that's great. I guess uh, as we continue here, we've got uh, uh, several questions that are around the same topic. I, gu I guess everybody's asking you to take a look into your crystal ball and uh, tell us what uh, what what uh, as we return to normal. Uh, you know, is there an expectation of what we can anticipate? The uh, trending will be and the impact it may have on the internet uh, uh, moving forward. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you a lot of numbers as well. But um, yeah, so so the idea, and I think Europe gave us a little bit of indication of, of, of what we can expect, and it's, it's going to be, it might slightly change as well. So so what you what we, we start to see as things sort of lift, we're expecting sort of the outages again to sort of increase again, that traffic engineering, because they're shifting their peering points back uh, from that one there. It might not occur in some instances because they've just gone through and beefed up all the infrastructure. So, so we're just going to cope with everything. But what we're also going to occur, I think now, is this is going to be a complete change in the work. There's going to be a more of a hybrid workforce out from there. So what we're going to see is, is, is um, a flattening off, essentially, of, of these outages. The traffic engineering is going to take place. But what they're, they're, you'll, you'll start to see is sort of a beefing up of infrastructure to cope with both instances. So rather than shifting everything around from a peering, uh, peering perspective across from there, I think what you will, will start to see is providers sort of balancing things out from there. So they will start to see what happens from a performance perspective uh, and then um, react essentially to what's happening from work work pattern. Like I said, if you look at the EMEA pattern, what we started to see was as uh, some of the countries started to come out of a lockdown phase earlier than others, we started to see what we believe this sort of shift in, in change uh, coming from, um, uh, from a usage pattern or from a, uh, a, a, a traffic engineering perspective. And I think we'll start to see that again in certain areas uh, coming from there. 
but they'll wait this time rather than going too early. We'll start to see this slower move while we start to increase things around the aspect there. I think also one of the things, you know, from a, from a, a different change, we're going to start to see this is definitely speeded up the um, uh, the adoption or the, the the digital transformation processes that we're starting to see around the place. So everybody's starting to move. You know, they had a digital transformation plan in place. They've accelerated that. So we're going to start to see that. I think we're going to start to see an increase in sort of the edge computing aspect of this, uh, as well as, you know, sort of uh, trying to move towards like a, a SASE type of base uh, from a, a security perspective in an edge compute world to start to move these types of areas out from there. Um, so that I'm thinking we're seeing from an industry type of trend. And then from a, a, a performance, we'll start to see again this slight increase in our years as we shift to a more hybrid model. That's great. Thanks for sharing that uh, that perspective with us. Um, so I, I think uh, now that we've uh, kind of covered the uh, foundational uh, topics, I think just to set the groundwork and set the stage for us, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, how we can use some of this performance data that we're now capturing and putting it, you know, into a more productive, uh, uh, useful tool set now that, you know, this is new insight we wouldn't have necessarily had before. Maybe yeah. you can share your thoughts on that. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is, you know, this is sort of where the rubber hits the road, really. So, you know, all this great data, we talk about the trends that are coming on from there, but what can we do with it? What does it mean to me? How can I make this work for me? coming from there and this is really what you know sort of what I want to cover here um, so so the, the idea is 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 I said you know no outage is the same you know an outage has a different impact coming across uh, from, from the various uh, uh, depending on what you're actually doing in that uh, that, that um, uh, as, a, as a customer or as, as a provider from those types of aspects there the idea is is really to take that data and actually then to look that in context so if we take that from uh, like say from an efficiency perspective so from an efficiency point of view is how much of my infrastructure is actually impacted. So I might have an outage, but how much of my infrastructure from an interface perspective is, is actually impacted? And we can start to trend that to actually see what's coming across uh, on a particular area in, in time. You know, obviously, if I get 0%, then none of my infrastructure is impacted. But what I'm looking to do is sort of then take that in context to how many locations are impacted, for example. If I've got 50% of my uh, infrastructure impacted, but it's in one, only impacting in one location, then you know, I can actually work out, well, I probably want to use that as a, as a transit provider or want to have a, a, an alternate person to come in from that area there. But if I've got sort of 8% in this one particular case there, as you look at August, and it's actually impacting sort of a wide area, then I know that's sort of a systemic failure within the environment. I don't want to see that occurring across my provider uh, right, right across from there. We then take aspects such as the user impact figure, and a user impact figure is really just applying a simple time of day. You know, when does it impact me and my, my region? If I'm, and how does my business operate? If I'm a 24 by seven, obviously I, my business hours are 24 by seven. But if, I've, if I'm just operating, you know, I'm a, a warehouse packing system or custom there, my busiest time is between uh, sort of uh, 12 till 3 p.m., then that might be the window I look like. I don't care if they have all their outages in the morning or at that uh, particular time, because that might be a provider where I can actually use. So taking the context of, of, of what I've got from there. And then the duration of that outage is, uh, so how long did it actually take to, um, uh, sort of how long was it out for, which gives an indication of how long does it take to resolve. Uh, you know, we track this or track this very simply, sort of based on the, a short, medium or long, where a medium is, um, uh, or let's start on the short. A short is sort of under 10 minutes, so it's out for 10 minutes. So it might be some automated remediation or, a simple config change, it took a while for like hold down times or something to proliferate throughout the network from there. A medium network is sort of a you know, 10 to 20 minutes, uh, so I'm starting to sort of impact from there. And anything beyond 20 minutes is cast a long one. You know, I have some sort of major failure going on from there. I need to take sort of uh, impact, see what's happening. It might be, you know, take long to resolve or I've had a, a, an infrastructure failure as, a, um, as opposed to a control plane going on from that, that type of system. And then, but, you, but rather than sort of averaging those out, so I'm looking at months here, let's look at that in the context of um, how many of those outages were, what was the predominant duration during that, that, that period. So, you know, if I've got 70% medium outages, then I might want to actually look from that one there. When did they occur? It wasn't too bad. It wasn't impacting my users because they're occurring during the night period or am I out of business hours from my particular area there? 
Uh, you know, whereas again, if I go to the August time period there for this particular provider, I have had 60% of those along, right? And it impacts a lot of my network. It didn't really impact my users because it happened uh, maybe at a weekend or, or, or out of hours, but it impacts a lot of locations. You know, if that occurs frequently throughout my, um, uh, my, my window, then I might want to watch that, you know, watch out for that as, as something I want to track. And the whole point of taking this data is I'm now adding context to this. You can now start to then effectively, so this is how the provider, I can now, what is my business practice that I'm going to be doing? What is it I want to do? And you can then start to overlay your own transaction on top of that. How's my transaction going to cope with this? We can start to add in other things, sort of loss rates and like from there, and really understand what's happened to that period. And once you get to that area there, to take that data, it allows you to do a whole number of things. So you can actually, if you're going out, you know, we're looking from an SD-WAN perspective, for example, I might want to pick different regional ISPs that I want to connect to for my SD-WAN, my internet connectivity part. I can actually take a look and understand how those ISPs perform over a period of time. But more importantly than that, once I've done that, this can actually start to form a relationship with that ISP. So we're not actually just relying on a, a, on a straight um, uh, you know, uh, latency loss jitter type of, uh, um, of SLA. We can actually start to collaborate with them to say, this is, this is what we're actually seeing across your environment there. And we want to start to measure and trend against that type of thing. So you start to move in what let's call it service level relationship as opposed to an SLA type of aspect from there. But again, sort of from an ongoing perspective, it also then starts you to um, uh, give some certainty as much as you can over the internet uh, itself, you know. So again, we've got these, um, uh, the working from home, which is, is looking to continue for, for some period of time. Lots of different internet providers, lots of last mile type of situations from there coming in and various locations there. We can reduce the risk as us from an organization, from an enterprise to actually understand how are they performing, but also it gives those providers, I say, a chance to come back and say, well, this is what we can provide to you in terms of a, a delivery of a system uh, to, to actually make sure that you're getting what we say on the label is, or what we're saying on the tin is what you get uh, out of the tin from that, that particular aspect there. So. Thank, that's great. Uh, I certainly appreciate the, you know, making it relevant uh, and uh, applying some uh, context to the data that you're actually capturing to start to derive uh, decision making. The, it looks like we do have one other question. I, I, I wasn't sure if we were going to have one or not, but it uh, uh, looks like Rich has come in with a, a quick question, and I think it actually is in reference to what we were just uh, talking about or you were just referencing a second ago and that was like well we we have now baseline performance data from a from a network point of view right now what about uh, how can I expand that to now inject application performance data or business critical application data into into that tool set to create a, a bigger picture yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great, great question. Again, and you know, we're starting to see this taking place within the uh, within the industry themselves. So again, you know, we, we've got that baseline information. Is our ISP performing over that from a from an enterprise perspective? We can say this is my business critical transaction, or this is my business critical application, and you can pick a function of that. So it might be a login, right? So it might be a login to an IHS system or to CRM or or, or to whatever. You can actually have that as a transaction. And then you can say, right, how does that perform across this particular ISP? So you're tracking that one there. But more importantly from that, you've got that baseline, exactly as you said that you have that baseline for it. That baseline can then start to form the basis of an SLA that you have with that relationship with your provider. This is the underlying performance. We're not sitting there in a QBR saying, oh, we only had four hours this month. We said, well, this is what it was, this is the impact to our users. But more important, they become responsible. They don't necessarily they're still effectively looking at latency, loss, jitter from their part of their demarcation perspective. So they now have responsibility to deliver. They understand that they're going to deliver this application within five seconds to everywhere in the world, right, where it is from that point of view. And they can then measure their performance in relation to that transaction using the thousand nice data. So then we start to have this living, breathing SLA that can start to move forward with them. So we can go from there. That's great. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, I thought that was very insightful as well. Um, I, I think we're ready to carry on here. And uh, I guess we've uh, 
reach the point of uh, you know discuss some of our takeaways. Uh, certainly, uh, I think your points around how the internet has evolved to a mission critical infrastructure for the enterprise. I, I think that uh, you uh, summarized that quite well, and and certainly now. Um, uh, being able to assess performance from uh, a network perspective so you can make intelligent decisions and, uh, you know, prepare your organization to adopt or adapt rather to, you know, these constantly changing environments is one of the reasons it's so important that, uh, you know, having visibility into this infrastructure now is is becoming more and more important. Um, I also uh, think you know one of the key points of today was this uh, you know comprehensive correlation is I guess what I'm going to call it, and that is you know bringing all of this information together, uh, you know both happening inside the network and potentially what's happening outside the network and uh, being able to look at that through kind of a single pane of glass to assess all the different um, potential uh, outcomes that may be impacting uh, overall performance. And then, of course, what we just talked about, being able to actually take information and create you know, essentially uh, an SLA out of it, right, which monitors the overall performance of your application itself uh, is something that's incredibly powerful. And now that you're running it over the internet, I could see that being a, a much more significant um, activity than it has been in the past. So thank you for all that insight today, uh, Mike. I, I thought it was great. Uh, I wanted to take a minute to uh, remind our audience very quickly, like I said at the onset, this uh, uh, webinar today is part of our Leading with Partners series, but it is also part of our broader series, which is biz uh, Business Resiliency in All Times. On the screen right now is a list of all the webinars that we've uh, undertaken over the last several weeks, uh, all of the uh, uh, them listed here are also accessible from a replay perspective. So please take some time if you're interested and uh, uh, explore some of these other webinars. I think you'll find uh, some of the content quite interesting. Um, of course, uh, a huge thank you to uh, our partner, Thousand Eyes, uh, which is now part of Cisco. We're very excited about that. Uh, and we're certainly excited to have the opportunity to work with you. And more importantly, Mike, I, I just want to say thank you to yourself for joining us late in your day from halfway around the world. I, I, I hope you get to have some coffee in, uh, in a little while or, or maybe not. But this was a really great session, and, and I really, really appreciate you walking through uh, how things look from uh, a Thousand Eyes perspective and certainly the value proposition you bring uh, to the table. Uh, also, a huge thank you to our audience. And if anybody wants to continue the conversation on this topic, please feel free to reach out to me. My email address is uh, on the screen now. And uh, I guess I will say uh, thank you again for your time. And uh, as I, I always do say, uh, today changes with orange. So thank you very much. Thank you.